promise of biomimicry is the fruit of three and a half billion years of evolution. Can a new breed of scientist-engineer specialising in biomimicry benefit business? Once we get into it, I think we will see major breakthroughs in industry. And perhaps we needed a crisis to get to that innovative thinking and just put it into a in practical, concrete framework now. Not because it is saving the world. It may have saved the world. But first and foremost, because it's more efficient, it's more competitive, it uses less energy, it allows you to have a perfect recycling of all the nutrients continuously. If you look at silk, it's made out of amino acids. That's all. This is a, an Australian orb web spider. Um, she spins one of the largest webs in the world. They're, they're fantastically strong. I mean, that's, that's the, the key point. Silkworm silk is not as strong, but it has the key advantage that it's produced commercially in enormous quantities. What we've produced is something that looks like this. Now, it may not look like it, but that is, from a molecular and materials perspective, absolutely identical to this stuff here. We've just processed it in a completely different way. We've, we've copied the way in which the spider spins its silk rather than the silkworm spins its silk. And that's how we get the properties in our knee cartilage device. And this mineralized version of our silk cartilage device is essentially biomimetic of human bone. And combining novel high performance biocompatible materials like ours with cell therapies could lead to replacement of heart valves, um, nerve repair. Um, we could even look at uh, very much more ambitious projects, um, growth of whole new organs. Another medical innovation, one that could save millions of lives, concerns vaccines protected in a radically new way. Vaccines easily lose their potency and have to be kept cold in a fridge and icebox supply chain. But has nature already solved the problem? The amazing desert resurrection plant can virtually die in drought and come back to life when it rains. Could its mechanisms protect vaccines? But these resurrection plants um, are quite amazing. When you put them in water, overnight they'll come back and they're actively living and, and uh, vigorous. But, uh, these organisms all contain a large amount of a sugar that I'd never heard of. And the sugar turned out to have these amazing properties of being able to completely preserve virtually any molecule that uh, we dried. It's very like prehistoric insects trapped in amber. Bruce Rosa has found a way of preserving vaccines by coating them in natural sugar glass. Well, the resurrection plant contains very large quantities of exactly the same sugar that we use in this uh, industrial process. We are spraying into this chamber billions of tiny droplets containing the vaccine trapped in glass suitable for uh, injection that up to 70% of all current vaccines are lost, either due to freezing or due to being exposed to high temperatures. In this form, uh, that problem goes away. The idea of sugar glass coated vaccines that can be carried anywhere might one day protect vaccines for tuberculosis, malaria or HIV. But we'll still need hospitals that are clean and bizarrely, shark skin is inspiring a new antibacterial surface. You would notice that when you go in one direction, you get it smooth. In the opposite direction, it feels rough like sandpaper. That's because the shark scales have a very unique structure to them. So we just use that basic geometry relationships to create our shark skin. So the concept that we use is we could emboss it. So you basically take a pattern and transfer it onto some other material. So on a biomedical side, the applications that we're looking at are hygienic surfaces. So things as simple as touch surfaces, the places that you have a lot of contact by humans. I was studying bacteria that I had available here at the university that were basically clinical from medicine. And so we studied some of those easily. E. coli, for example, everybody's heard of E. coli. And so we did those and nothing, the E. coli wouldn't grow. Then nothing would grow on the surface. 
Shark skin type materials could work on ship's hulls to naturally stop the buildup of barnacles and algae. And another way to stop algal buildup, but in water tanks, has been developed from spirals that occur everywhere in nature. It's, it's ubiquitous. We see it in um, the cochlea of our ears, our logarithmic spirals, to capture um, the full range of harmonics within sound. That logarithmic spirals were the way that things grow, the way that fluids move, um, the way that heat transfers. However, nobody has applied these geometries into industrial applications. Already our impeller is six inches tall and approximately three inches in diameter at its peak. And that is the same impeller that we've mixed all the way up to a seven million gallon tank. It's pushing a flywheel. It's continuously adding energy into a natural convection current. It takes very little energy to maintain it. We've managed to compare the methods that biology uses and the methods that technology uses to solve the same type of problem. We solve problems 75% of the time using energy. So energy is our biggest solver of problems. You look at nature and energy is the least important of all the factors. You're not using energy. The most important is information. We don't do anything quite so brilliantly as the leaf does it. Our photosynthesis stops halfway. We produce power. It emulates what this leaf does. But it isn't as intelligent as the five million odd years of history that we have in the development of the leaf. Take a leaf in sunlight, which inside has a catalyst, chlorophyll. Together, they take the carbon molecules out of the CO2 in the air and then they take the hydrogen out of the H2O, the water all around. The leaf then recombines these molecules into carbohydrate sugars so that the leaf can grow. The people who are studying photosynthesis still don't fully understand the process. You know, the thousands of people working on that around the world um, justify our small amount of work in taking what they learn and bringing it into artificial photosynthesis or emulating photosynthesis. Gavin Tullock's solar cell uses a dye instead of a leaf's chlorophyll as a catalyst and a titanium metal grid that collects the electrons as electricity. In a leaf, the electron doesn't stop at producing electricity. What a leaf does is it goes the full cycle and uses that electron for chemical production. This is the future, of course. And then the light shines through the uh, photoanode where we make oxygen. And you can make the uh, hydrogen on a platinum electrode in the back. That's where we're making hydrogen. At Penn State University, Tom Malouk's team is working on a solar cell that could be the future. Same orange dye catalyst, platinum, not titanium, but also splitting water to make hydrogen. If you can make hydrogen from sunlight, then uh, you can make uh, fuel, liquid fuel, such as ethanol, for example, or even gasoline, uh, by chemical processes from the hydrogen. And this wouldn't require starting with oil or coal. And so we need to devise ways to use the energy of the sun to make the fuel we need. There's now more political will but there's still technical problems. We've still got to make it work and we've got to make it economically competitive. It's not the easiest thing in the world to emulate even a small part of a leaf. But if we don't understand how it happens, we will never get the best possible low energy solutions for our products. And, and this is where we need to see that in the new economy, the new business model, it is not just inspired by nature, it is substituting something with nothing. Now that's fantastic because you become very competitive. Inefficiency is rarely tolerated in nature. Very little is wasted in the pursuit of survival. Our innovations can learn from nature's supreme efficiency. 
Although biomimicry is still young, the potential benefits for humankind are truly inspiring. The tragedy is that the resource, nature's great variety of species, is vanishing fast. <laughs>